And there we go. Good evening, everybody. Again, um, massive thank you to those listening on the audio experience. Big thank you to those watching the replay on YouTube as well or on actsonthis.tv. And a huge welcome to everybody who's showing up live. We're just having a little chat. Fanny's here, Sam's here, Jen's here, um, Lucy's here. Loads of people are here. Uh, And we were just having a little chat to begin with about Instagram before I kind of started this scope um, properly tonight. Um, I set a challenge for everybody on Monday night called the Acts on This TV Instagram hashtag doc you challenge, as in document you. I wanted people to start using Instagram stories to document their life. A few people actually, while I remember, I don't think might not even realize what an Instagram story is because I see people are posting Instagram pictures to their main profile. Um, and there's a few people who might not even be aware of what a story is. So Instagram stories, guys, isn't the regular Instagram. Um, it's the it's regular Instagram app, but it's, a, it's actually a different part of the app. So within the app itself, you have your regular posts and then you have your Instagram stories as well. And your stories are these these posts that really only only live for 24 hours. Now, in order to post to your story when you take a picture or I know Fanny was struggling to take video you hold the button down when you're taking video Fanny I'm glad you got there in the end on that one um you can um you can then once you've filmed your video or, or you know you've got your picture ready to post you can actually click on the bottom um left hand corner it says your story add to story and it's got like a little arrow pointing down when you click on that it doesn't post it to your main profile it posts it to your story now to for you to watch other people's stories you simply click on their icon, they're like their avatar, so their you know their profile picture. You click on that, and that's how you watch their story. So people will post multiple 15-second clips a day to really document their lives, and that's what I want people to do. Um, Fanny said it drove her mad realizing how finding out how to record. Yeah, it's um, so when you you're getting used to a new platform, Fanny, it's dead easy. You know when you know how, but like you know when you're getting used to it, yeah, you know sometimes it can be difficult. So Instagram stories, just to clarify, are separate to Instagram posts. And if you want to get involved with the Instagram stories, which is I think I think is the most compelling part of the app because these only live for 24 hours, so it's going to keep people coming back to your profile. Um, then use the stories, and you do that, like I say, by taking your picture. Uh, within the app or taking your video within the app and then actually clicking you know the add to story button so it goes to your story not actually on your main wall Um, and you can watch other people's stories because when you're on the the home feed when you click on the furthest left tab and it says home on it it's like a little house you can watch other people's instagram stories because they'll be at the very top of the page in little circles and you'll see all the people who have posted new stories because they've got a multicolored circle around their profile picture so, and it will put them in order of who's posted first who's posted last so you can always keep up with what people are doing um how do you like people's stories there's no button so you don't know so you don't like any stories funny you just watch them and it will tell the other person that you've watched i can see who's watched my stories today um, and then what you can do though is if the person has it activated in their profile you can send them a message and at the bottom so i have this turned on on mine so if you watch a story of mine and you're like actually i want to comment on that in the bottom left hand corner of your screen it says send message click on that and just type your message and then that gets sent through to me but it says people have liked mine now people will like your posts i'm pretty certain you can't like somebody's story you just watch it um you can like comments and you can like instagram posts but as far as I know, I mean, I'm learning as well, but as far as I know, yeah, you, you don't like the stories because there is no there is no button to like, I don't think. I, I, think. I think literally you can just flick through people's stories by tapping the screen either on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. The left-hand side will take you back a story. The right-hand side will take you forward a story. Um, but let me know if that's not the case because we're all learning together. But it's been fascinating. I've seen behind the scenes of everybody's life this week, which has been great. It's so much more interesting than static posts static pictures pictures of bullshit coffees lattes nonsense like that you know i've seen sam who's on here rehabilitating his shoulder um i've seen bobby doing crazy accents um i love the one with the dog oh yeah i went to i had a parcel delivered to a friend's house today that should have come to my house and he texted me going mate why have i got a parcel like a neighbor i was like i've no idea the driver's obviously just dropped off at the wrong house and i went around and he's got a beautiful little pug um called simba uh good evening brian um so i put simba on my story today i also went to barnsley to do a voiceover for a radio advert documented the whole journey there took two stories when i was in the booth recording the voiceover but i had no internet to upload it 
And normally Instagram will just save that and actually upload it when it gets a connection. I did something wrong, guys, and I deleted them. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. So effectively, I documented the whole journey there, going, guys, I'm going to show you behind the scenes of this voiceover, um, and then deleted them, and then basically just documented my journey back. So um, it was crazy. Brian's um, in his... Brian, do you like my car? I don't know if I've seen your... Have I seen your story, Brian? Um, I don't know if I have or I haven't. Um Make sure if you want me to see your stuff, guys, that you tag at Act On This TV in your story. So when you've created a story, so you've created a video or a... Um... Oh, that was Sam. I did see your car, Sam. Yes, I did. Silver. It looks like a silver sporty car. I don't know what it is, but it looks nice. Um, yeah, you can actually tag people in your stories by clicking the text icon in the top right-hand corner. And then you write some text on your story. Now, within that text... If you put the at symbol and then start writing like act on this, so at act on this TV, it will come up and let you select that as an at mention, very similar to Twitter. I think you might have to be following the person uh, in order for Instagram to auto fill that for you. Um, but yeah, you can put at and then whoever, and then it will say, I will get a notification then going, you know, Sam has just mentioned you in his story. And I say it to everybody because I love watching these at the end of the day when I can see the full story, like the full day of what you've been doing. Um, if you just tag me in the first one, you don't need to tag me in any of the others, but if you tag me in the first like clip of the day, um, then at least at the end of the day, I can you know I can go back through and go, right, who's tagged me today? Um, and I can watch all of your stuff. You don't need to tag me in every single one of your of your things because obviously you want you know your audience to feel involved as well. If you're just mentioning one person in every story, then they're going to be feeling a bit left out. Um, but yeah, definitely tag me in the first one and I can go back and watch. Um I've not seen your stuff, funny. I watch it tonight, though. Tag me in, in a clip so I know I know where it is and I'll make sure I'm following you as well. Um, but it's great, guys. You know, the long and short of it is I love it. Um, the challenge is to do it for seven days, but I reckon once you've done it for seven days, you're going to want to do it for a lot longer than that and then you're going to start building an audience. It's nice. I mean, you know, I see 75, 80 people watching my stories a day and I know that doesn't seem, you know, it's not millions of followers, is it? But we've all got to start somewhere. Those people who, who have now got two, three million followers you know, in a huge audience, they started with one, one follower, you know. Um, so don't, the thing that does my head in, you know, about some people when they get onto these new platforms is they, they expect everything to happen in three weeks. Like, oh man, I've been posting this content for three weeks and no one's watching. Well, what did you expect? And then they quit. And then when you quit, I mean, that's it. No one's ever going to see your stuff again. You've got to persevere, you know. I've got, a, you know, a relatively good following for the acts on this uh, Twitter account. It's 15,000 people follow me on Twitter, but that's taken me six years to amass, you know, and I've not cheated, I've not gone out and bought a shitload of followers that can get me banned from Twitter, you know, you can effectively buy Chinese robots to follow you on Twitter, you know, that's just an organic engagement, but that's taken six years to get 15,000, yes, there are people with millions of followers, and, you know, and that's taken them years as well, you can't rush this stuff, it takes bloody ages to get followers in the right ones, says Fanny, it does, but when you fall in love with the process that's all that matters. And don't whatever you do compare success to the number of fucking followers you've got because it's bullshit. You know, there will always be somebody with more than you. There will always be people with less than you. But the fact is that the winners are consistent. And if you want to win and you don't want to lose in life, you've got to be consistent in everything you do, whether that's social media presence, working hard on yourself, on your body, on your family, on your relationships. If you haven't got consistency, you've got nothing. Um, so you've got to be consistent. Um, but I look forward to seeing what people are going to be doing for the rest of the week and, you know, and for the foreseeable. Hey, people, carry it on. So tonight's book club, guys, we're looking at a fantastic book this month. Um, it's, um, what's funny saying? I had, a, I had a male escort agency follow me. <laughs> there you go, Fanny. Get yourself involved. Have a good time. Um, yeah, uh, we'd look at this book, guys. The Top Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware. Now, we've looked at two chapters of this over the last two weeks. And Give me some hearts if you think it's been powerful. The first chapter we looked at was about living a life that you want to, you know, one of the top regrets of, of the, de the dying is that they didn't live a life for them. They lived it for somebody else or they lived a life that they thought other people wanted them to live. The hearts are flooding through. Um, it's really powerful that. Was a, the story was about a woman called Grace who married a guy she shouldn't have married, lived with him and like he described him as a tyrant until the point in his life where he became so ill he had to go into a home. She felt free, like, oh my God, I've got this guy out of my life. And then less than a year later was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died. 
having never lived effectively, you know, and the regret there that Bronny, who wrote the book and who worked in palliative care, end of life care for years, the lesson there was, you know, live a life that you want to live for you, not for anybody else. Last week, we looked at the story of a woman called Rosemary, who and uh, who had never allowed herself to be happy effectively. You know, she had kind of like been this this woman, business woman, had something to prove to the world, prove to men, prove to, you know, corporate America um, that she was just as good as everybody else. And through that develops a really harsh personality, um, very defensive and ultimately kind of never allowed herself just to be happy. Um and she only realized at the end of her life again that she could allow herself to be happy and happiness was a choice. She didn't have to fight her way through life. Um, that's what happened to me, says Fanny. Is that, is that, I'd missed any other comments, Fanny. Is that what you're talking about? You've, you've been fighting through your life, so you've developed this, you've overdeveloped. A lot of people, and, and they can, either sex can do this, so women can very easily overdevelop their masculine side. We all have a masculine part of ourselves and we all have a feminine part of ourselves. Um, regardless of whether you're a guy or a girl, women, unfortunately, it, when they've been through a lot of trauma or they've they, they've had to fight either a man or a situation or a job or a boss or whatever, um, can very often overdevelop the masculine part of their life um, and their personalities. And then they do become quite hard and harsh and they lose that little girl, that playful kind of, you know, feminine um, aspect of, of their personality. And that's a real shame. Um, it's not lost forever. You can get that back. Um, guys equally, you know, can can do it the other way when they're you know a guy grows up and they're, they're surrounded by female influences his whole life, can overdevelop that side and then become quite weak in terms of um, just kind of standing up for himself effectively and can be easily dominated. And you know, and and guys and girls can equally be in abusive relationships. It's not always, you know, a uh, a, a, a woman who is being, you know, dominated in, a, in an abusive relationship. I know personally, like, people in my life who were in marriages where the woman was very violent um, and they had over, you know, these, these men had become very subservient and overdeveloped, like, a you know, a more of a feminine side to their personalities and were completely um, trapped. You know, one guy said to me, he said, I stayed married for 10 years longer than I should. I wish I'd have got out. But he just couldn't because she completely, utterly destroyed him in terms of his, um, um, well, just everything about him, really. His entire personality made him feel worthless. Um, and he didn't know happiness was a choice, you know. He just thought it was something that he didn't deserve or whatever. And then 10 years later, effectively, he got out of that relationship and started to live his life. And now he's very fulfilled. Um, but didn't realize for so long, wasted so a decade in that relationship. So happiness is a choice and that's what we learned from Rosemary's story tonight we're going to read a story guys um from regret number three and that is that I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings and this this is like something genuinely like expressing my feelings as I've always struggled with this and I don't know whether that was because I mean I was brought up very much so as a guy by a very you know kind of my dad was super super alpha male very masculine and I was brought up in a generation of boys don't cry but you know if you fall over or you get fouled playing football get up don't cry you girl all this kind of stuff so I've gone through my life kind of like I think sometimes I'm getting so much better at it now but very much kind of struggling to express my feelings and tell people the truth or how I'm feeling and sometimes you know I, I will mask that um, and we, we, I mean, it's something we all have to work on. We're all going to get better at it when we're conscious of it. And tonight we're going to look at the story um, of a man called Joseph and his inability ultimately to express his feelings um, and the trouble it can kind of get you into. And he has to die in this chapter because the people we talk about in this chapter it is the five regrets of the dying. They unfortunately all die in the end. We know how this story ends. Um but we're still alive. We can learn from this. Um, and he dies with the regret that he never really got to express his feelings. Um, give me some some hearts. And also share this, guys, before I start reading, if you, if you, if you would. If you click the three dots in the bottom corner and, um, and just share it out on Twitter, share it out on Facebook. Let's get some people uh, here who can benefit from this as well. Um, but give me some like comments. If, if you think there's parts of your life that you struggle expressing your feelings, maybe you don't tell 
your partner or your family or your friends exactly how you're feeling for fear of something i don't know good or bad whatever you know situation you're in uh, maybe you don't express your feelings about your career about really what you want to achieve with your life about your your goals your mission in life maybe you feel that if you express what you'd really like to do people would ridicule you or mock you or tell you you couldn't do it so you don't bother and you keep that desire locked away and it's like nah i can't ever do that that would never work for me my masculine side due to defense scars uh people away and i'm left with oh pushes people away and i'm left with no one around well we see well self-awareness funny is critical here and if you if you're aware the worst thing that would happen in the situation if you weren't aware of that and everybody else was going god fanny's really harsh isn't she um yeah she's like really you know stern character yeah you know don't want to be around her you don't portray that on your online presence from what i know of you i think i've met you briefly for like 10 seconds in real life at surviving actors but you don't give off that harsh uh exterior online when you're doing your improvisation videos and all that kind of stuff um so if you're aware of that maybe happening in real life then it's kind of it's, it's good that you're aware of it because you can do something about it if you couldn't do anything about it because you weren't aware of it that's when you'd have some trouble um so what you want to do is rather than saying oh this is how it is um this is what i've done um, then you can just actually go, right, this is what I, I have done and now I'm going to change it. Siri has decided to turn himself on on my phone and he's now recording everything that I'm saying and now I need to get back out of here and get into Periscope somehow. So <laughs> bear with me while I try and get my comments back. There we go. I think I've got him. I've frozen a little bit, but hopefully I haven't frozen for you guys. <laughs> let, let me know if I have. But Siri decided to turn himself on on my iPhone. Thank you for sharing this. Um, so let's um, let's begin. We'll start reading this. Give me some comments and some hearts if uh, everything is still working. You still see me or end. Like I say, my Periscope app, because Siri's gone mental, has decided to just freeze a little bit. Um, Fanny says, thanks, guys. When we meet in real life, you can decide. We will. We will decide in real life when we all meet you, Fanny. But I think if you're aware of that and you're like, I have overdeveloped my masculine side in order because I had to. Sometimes people, I mean, you have to do that to survive sometimes and if you've had to do that um then hopefully you no longer have to do that and you can rediscover the feminine side and a little girl that every you know every woman has a little girl inside of them who's like the playful you know kind of dancing around we all do as, as, as a guy i have that little boy who's mischievous and like you know loves running around and just you know doing what little boys do and as adults we um we very often kind of forget about that um and we don't you know we uh we cover all that up. I'm just going to jump back on Periscope here and just make sure that I am still, I'm all still good and I'm on. I think I am, but I don't know if um, Periscope's just decided it's going to uh, play crazy tonight. Oh no, it's all right. I think I'm in. I'm going to view the broadcast, and I think we should be, uh, we should be good. Should be back on. Yes, it looks like I'm back on. <laughs> Excellent. Good stuff. Um, excellent. My connection is hopping out. Says uh, Caroline. Well, hopefully it's. Um, it's good if you X out and come back in. Everybody's here. Right, guys. Let's begin then. Let's have a little uh, a little look at this book. I'm going to paraphrase some stuff, and I've chopped some of the chapters out, uh, some of the parts of the chapter out, um, because it's a big chapter. It's only actually 10 pages, this chapter, but um, it's small text. Look at it. So it can take quite a while. As always, I'm going to give you eye contact. I'm going to try and keep an eye on the comments, and I'm also going to uh, obviously have to read the book. So if I miss a comment... Don't worry about it. Just ask it again when I give a, you know, give the nod and, uh, and I hope you better read it. So it says, for a 94-year-old man, 94, guys, for a 94-year-old man who was dying, Joseph looked remarkably well when we first met. He was a gentle person with a lovely smile that made him look like a young boy at times. With his, uh, with his quiet but very quirky sense of humour, I warmed to him straight away. Joseph's family had decided not to tell him he was dying. And I found this difficult, but I tried to respect their decision as much as I possibly could. Over the next few weeks, however, his illness took a downhill um, spiral for the worse, which was impossible to ignore. Standing unaided became a thing of the past, and with each new day, he depended on my strength more and more. His illness was not something that needed to be pointed out. It was obvious every time he tried to stand or sit, and it was something that was silently registered between us with each effort. So while the family continued the charade of not telling him he was dying, Joseph's own realisation was setting in. He was indeed a very ill man. So it's not, it's not a great start for him from the off here. 
Medications were used to compensate his pain as much as possible, but um, but as was the case with many people, the side effects of the medication were blocked up bowels. There are drugs to then compensate for that, but they weren't really working for Joseph. So I was, oh, this is the intimate detail of palliative care here. So I was requi- required to assist with bowel discharge by inserting medication into his rectum. The poor old fellow. Once you're, at this, once you're this ill, there's no privacy anymore. Certainly there was no dignity now as Joseph rolled onto his side for me to insert the small tube. Bloody hell, Joseph. I tried to keep the situation light, of course, and found myself speaking words I would hear myself saying regularly to others. It all starts off being about food and poo, Joseph. And in the end, um, it all ends up being about food and poo. I gently joked with him. Working with the dying really, truly brought home to me the cycle of life. The things that keep a baby most comfortable at the very beginning are the food and the release of their bowels and wind. And at the end of life, the questions everyone asks of the dying person are if they are still eating and are their bowels working correctly. It's a relief to everyone when someone who's dying and is on strong painkillers finally manages a bowel movement, easing this other pain. So is the case for Joseph and his family when he made a dash to the toilet soon after, <laughs> incredible detail here, and enjoyed an explosion from his bum. Of course, this brought me relief too, not only because my client was more comfortable, but also that I'd succeeded in this procedure on my very first attempt. One of his sons lived in a nearby suburb and visited daily. Another lived interstate, his daughter lived overseas. And each day, Joseph and his son would chat for a while, mostly about the business pages of the newspaper until Joseph became too tired. This was not long as his health was deteriorating so quickly. I liked his son, though didn't find, uh, didn't feel a strong connection with him. I had no reason not to like him, though. When I mentioned to Joseph later that his son was a very nice man, he replied with, he's only interested in my money. Preferring to take people as I find them, I try to keep this comment from influencing my own experience of his son. Over the next few weeks, my client shared many stories with me, mostly about the love of his his work. He and his wife, Gisela, had been uh, Holocaust survivors, managing to find their way to Australia upon their release. Stories about his time in the camps came out in fragments, but I didn't push it. I was there to listen, but not to determine what he wanted to share. It was obvious that life was easier for both of them by not discussing it. Trying to emphasise as much as possible with the situation, I hated to think how much pain they were each carrying and my heart went out to them. Joseph and I fell into an easy association and stories on other subjects flowed well. We had similar senses of humour and had been uh, both fairly quiet natured. Um, So we liked each other. The generation gap made little difference as we came to share a strong conversational flow, one that strengthened daily. All the while, Gisela would come in with food, constantly encouraging Joseph to eat. She was a great cook, but thought, um, but um, though he was hardly able to eat at all by now, she still cooked huge quantities. A part of this was probably habit, but a part of it was denial. This is the important bit here, guys. The family had somehow also convinced Joseph's doctor not to tell him that he was dying. It was a massive denial, but no one, um, but not only were they not telling him the truth about his condition and the inevitable decline, the family were trying to convince him he was getting better. Come on, Joseph, eat up. You'll be getting better in no time, Gisela would say repeatedly. And my heart felt for her too. To be so scared of the truth must have been a huge burden to bear. By this time, Joseph was down to just a tub of yoghurt a day and was incredibly weak, no longer even able to walk to the lounge room without assistance. Um, But they were still telling him he would be better in no time. I stayed silent on the topic until Joseph brought it up with me directly. Gets a bit serious here. Gisela had just left the room. Joseph was sitting back and I was giving him a foot massage, something he'd never had in his life but had now grown accustomed to, with great delight over the previous weeks. I love pampering my clients and perhaps this is why we grew so close. A lot of the conversation I had with them were while I was massaging feet, brushing hair, scratching backs or filing their nails. I am dying, aren't I, Bronny? He said when she was out of the room. I looked at him with kindness and nodded. Yes, Joseph, you are. He nodded with the relief of being told the truth. After my experience, my experience with Stella's family, and Stella's from a chat we haven't read yet, guys, there was no way I was going to be anything but honest from here on. He looked out of the window for some time. The foot massage continued in comfortable silence. Thank you. Thank you for telling me the truth, he finally replied in his thick accent. 
I smiled gently and nodded. Silence lingered for a moment or two, and then he spoke again. They just can't handle it, he said of his family. Gisela can't face the pain of talking with me about it. She'll be okay, she just can't talk about it. He was peaceful in knowing his situation, and I was peaceful in having been honest. He continued, I don't have long left, do I? I don't think so, Joseph, I said. Weeks, months, he questioned. Look, I really don't know, but I'd guess it's only a week, uh, only weeks or days. That's my feeling. But I really don't know, I told him honestly. He nodded and looked out the window again. Very few people can predict exactly when someone is going to pass, unless the person is obviously in their last few days. But it was a question clients and families always asked, sometimes repeatedly. And by now I was starting to gauge the decline of people, also seeing how quickly things could change. Often clients would appear to pick up again briefly before the final turn home. The success of my role as a carer really came down to me want, uh, working intuitively. It was on that basis I'd answered Joseph's question, even if somewhat reluctantly. I just didn't want to lie and say he had months left when there was no way he did. The foot massage was finished and I sat looking out the window too. He broke the silence after a time. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Waiting, I let him continue. I loved my work, I really loved it, and that's why I worked so hard. That and to provide for my family and their family. Well, that's a beautiful thing, I said, so why regret it? He explained that his regrets were purely for his family, um, who had seen so little of him for most of their life in Australia. But it was mostly as well, because he felt he'd never given them a chance to know him. I was too scared to let my feelings show. So I worked and worked and kept the family at a distance. They didn't deserve to be alone. Now I wish they really knew me. Joseph said he really hadn't known himself until recent years, so questioned how they could have stood a chance of knowing him anyway. His lovely eyes were sad as we talked about the patterns of relationships and how difficult it is to break those. We also discussed how necessary it is for a relationship to reach its greatest potential. He also felt that he'd missed the opportunity to create loving warmth with his children. Someone thinks that I didn't catch the username, but someone thinks it's a generational thing, this. I think so as well a little bit when it comes to, to work and, and men going out to work back in the day. The only example he had ever set was how to earn and value money. What's the point of that now, he sighed. Well, I tried to reason, you've done what you intended. You're leaving them with a comfortable life. You've provided for them as you wanted to. A solitary tear ran down his cheek. But they don't know me. They don't know me. I looked at him lovingly. And I want them to, he said. As the tears started to flow, I sat in silence as he cried. After a while, I suggested it wasn't too late, but he disagreed. He was too frail to speak for long periods now, so that alone would have made it difficult. He also admitted to not knowing how to talk with them about such depth of feelings. So I offered to go and get Gisela and his son to include them in the current conversation, saying it may be easier with me there, perhaps. But he shook his head and he dried his tears and he said, no, it's too late. Let's not tell them I know. It's easier for them thinking the way they do. I know I'm dying and it's OK. Now, in this part of the book, um, Bronnie goes on to talk about her grandmother and how this reminder of her gran and her gran was like almost closer to her than her mum. And would kind of stick up for her to her mom and let her get away with a few more things and was always kind of there for her. Um, and there comes a day when when Bronnie realises that her gran's not going to be there forever. Um, and this is where I'll catch up on that. If you want to read about her experience in depth with a gran, obviously check out the uh, check out the book. But I'll read the point where um, it gets to the point where she's like, I know my gran's not going to be around um, forever. Um, so she says, Gran outlived all of her brothers and sisters, which was heartbreaking for her, as they'd been like her own children. We'd write to each other from wherever I was living and share our lives as an open book, because she could talk to her Gran about her feelings. You know, it was super open. It wasn't like Joseph. I shared her sadness of losing her last sister and her frustrations in growing older, gradually losing her independence. Seeing her slow down over the years was heartbreaking for me too, as I had to face the fact that she wasn't going to be around forever. I started to find it hard to hold back the tears whenever we would talk, so I openly told her how much I loved her um, and how much I was going to miss her when her time came. After that, we were able to speak about death which, uh, with so candid honesty. 
I'm so glad we did. With no denial of what lay ahead, we savoured every conversation we had. And she was able to share her thoughts about passing with me. Graham was ready to go for years before she did. So it's a complete opposite to how Joseph is with his family. Returning from a few years overseas, I couldn't wait to see her. The changes were huge. With hair now totally white, she walked with a stick and had shrunk even more. My gran was now an old lady. She was in her 90s, but still the amazing woman I knew. Her mind was clear and our conversation continued on with great satisfaction for another year or so. The phone call came on a Monday while I was at work in one of my last bank jobs because Bronnie worked in banking that she hated before she went into palliative care. Managing the local branch, she, she had passed away the night before dying in her sleep. My world fell out beneath me and I shut the office door. With my head between my arms on the desk, I sobbed in farewell to my beloved darling grandmother and for my loss. Oh, gran. I cried into my own arms. Leaving work early, bleary-eyed and too sad to think clearly, I stopped at the mailbox, flicking through the letters and bills half numb. I halted in amazement. There amongst them was a card from my little gran. She'd posted it on Friday and died naturally in her sleep on Sunday night. That's cool, isn't it? Well, it's not cool she died, but it's, it's lovely to get that after death. A torrent of tears flowed from both sorrow and joy as I held the card to my heart, sobbing but almost laughing at the same time. I was so grateful for the connection that we'd shared and for having had the honesty to talk about death with her. There was nothing left unsaid. She knew I loved her and I knew she loved me. Nothing left unsaid. Even more so when I read the beautiful words she had written. I love you, my, uh, I love you dearly, my darling. You are so often in my thoughts. May sunshine follow you all the days of your life, Bron. Love, Gran. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Great message to get the day after your grand's died. Or no, the day of finding out. Bloody hell. The thought of her dying may have brought me tears before her departure. And I certainly cried after the event. But there was peace too, knowing we'd faced what inevitably happens to everyone with honesty and openness. That peace stays with me still. Her face smiles back at me from a photo frame on my desk. While there are days I miss her dearly these years on, I've no doubt that honesty gave us a relationship so special and positive that it continues to shape me in the best possible ways. It wasn't so easy for my dear client Joseph, though. The honesty was now too painful for him and his family. My heart went out to him as I felt his pain and frustration. What that dear man must have experienced in his life, I still hated to imagine. Gisela continued to come in with enormous meals, encouraging Joseph to eat up, and he just smiled gently at her and declined the meal each time. Other carers came in for an evening, but I was the main day carer. Um, we knew each other, and it was comfortable and easy for him, especially now he was able to open up, or at least to me. It was a surprise then, and with sadness, that I learned I was being replaced. His son had been complaining of the costs of care, explaining to his son that his father only had a matter of weeks or so left, he still chose to make other plans anyway, um, saying Joseph could live on for ages. Finding an illegal worker willing to do the job for next to nothing was a solution. Pleading with Gisela to convince their son otherwise, it was no use. Their minds were made up. There was other work waiting for me elsewhere as well. That wasn't the issue, though. It was that Joseph's family had been able to talk um, and he was comfortable with me. Uh, it was that Joseph had family. Uh, yeah, it's so... so that Joseph had finally been able to talk and he was comfortable with me. Surely his happiness should have been their priority for the last week or two of his life. I hated to think of how impersonal the alternative might be, especially as he was no longer able to speak a lot due to weakness and breathing difficulties. I felt for the new carer too and the language difficulties that they'd faced together. But it was out of my hands and I had to trust that these events were also a part of Joseph's life journey. How can any of us know what another is here to learn? We can't. So with a hug and a smile that said more than words were ever going to, we said our goodbye. Pausing at the doorway of his room one last time, I looked at him again. We each smiled the same way at each other, saying nothing but saying so much. Then it was time to go, driving away from his home, knowing he would be, state he would be staring out of the window in his own thoughts by now. My tears flowed. This role was exposing me to people I would have never met otherwise, and I loved what was shared and learned through each other, as hard as it sometimes was. Joseph's granddaughter called me about a week later to tell me that he died the night before. I was glad for him. His illness would never have allowed him any more quality of life anyway. It was for the best. 
Contemplating all that had unfolded, I found only blessings. Learning through these dear people before they died was a rare gift, and for that I was grateful. We'll all die, but this work was reminding me we all have a choice too on how to live in the meantime. Seeing the anguish Joseph experienced in not being able to express his feelings left me determined to always try and be brave enough to share mine. My walls of privacy were being eroded and I began to wonder why we are all so afraid of being open and honest. Of course, it's to avoid pain that may come as a result of our honesty. But those walls we create bring pain of their own by stopping others from knowing who we truly are. Watching the tears fall down the lovely old man's face as he's longed to be known and understood changed me forever. After receiving the phone call about Joseph's passing, I sat in a park near the beach, just absorbing the surroundings. Children were playing everywhere, and I watched how naturally they all shared their feelings. If they liked someone, they just said it. If they were sad, they cried, released it, and were happy again. They didn't know how to suppress their feelings. It was beautiful to watch the honest expressions. It was also refreshing to see how they all played and worked on things together. We've created a society where adults are now so insular and apart. Working together, expressing their feelings and being joyous with the natural states of the children I watched. While it made me sad that as adults we've just lost our ability to be totally open. It also brought me hope though. If we were once like that... Um, uh, and we would have been to varying degrees... Then perhaps we could learn to be that way again. I made a clear decision in the park there by the beach. I was not going to find myself ever regretting things... As dear Joseph had. It was time to be more courageous... And to start expressing my feelings more. The walls around my heart were of no use anymore. The process of dismantling them was at last now underway. And that's where that chapter ends. Um, I think it's powerful. Again, I think all of these regrets that these people have had are so powerful. And we're so lucky, guys. Because we get... We're not, we're not at that point. No one on here is at that point where it's too late. And we're so fortunate. And I'm so grateful to be able to read stuff like this and actually be like, you know what? I can learn from this. Um, that's touched me the most, says Caroline. Um, I think it's really important. I, I, I mean, I had, the, I had this thing like, I, you know, I said I've kind of struggled with expressing my feelings, you know, over over the years. I'm, I'm much better at it now. But when I was younger, um, I honestly, I mean, I, I look at this, I'm like, God, I feel a bit bad about this. But because I was I was brought up, you know, I told me my dad was like proper alpha male. Um, only once in my life did I say the words to my dad, I love you. Once. And 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 he died. I, I mean, you know, not because, not because of that. But like, I don't get the opportunity to say that anymore. Um, but that was just because of the way we, with the relationship we had as boys, you know, kind of like men and, you know, sons and dads kind of sometimes can have that kind of relationship. Um, but I didn't get that, um, you know, I didn't get that kind of honesty with him in terms of my feelings. And we knew we did, but it just wasn't kind of like a proper said kind of thing. It was something that I would just shy away from. I don't know why. I really don't know why. It just made me feel like, oh, guys don't do this. Um, you know, and there's been other things in my life that I've, I've kind of, not talked about um it wasn't until recent years i started talking about my eye condition you know because i'm like right i'm losing my sight i don't want to tell anyone about that i don't want anyone to judge me for it even though i've not earned it it's not like i've, I've done anything bad to get it they don't want to feel like you know the disabled label or that kind of thing which then made me not talk about it um and then in recent years when i talk about it dead openly but like it's so much good comes from it so much good did your father tell you he loved yours? Um, yeah, no, he did. My dad was, my, yeah, no, my dad was much better at it than me, but not like all the time. Um, he would say he, he was really. My dad was really good at saying how proud he was of me. Um, the whole love word, just I don't know, his guys doesn't kind of come up. I don't know for me it didn't in terms of like just a blokey kind of thing. Really, it's so weird, isn't it? It's just so because it's so like <laughs> it should be so normal. 
Um, but no, he was very good like that. But he was a proper blokey bloke, you know. And it was it was one of those things, you know. Oh, if if I was ill, or you know, or if I was uh, you know playing football and you know they got tackled or something like that, he'd be like, get up, you know, come on, you know, just you know carry on. That's what you do. You get up and you run the pain off. You don't. Um, cry about it caroline says her dad's exactly the same that and his family i think it's a generational thing as well you know i think my, my dad my dad didn't have a dad around because his dad died when he was about two or three um you know so i don't know if he'd experienced that and when you don't experience it yourself then how can you learn how to give it out um doesn't for me it's not natural for guys i think with their dads it's weird isn't it because girls are very much like love you mom all this kind of guys just don't seem to be like that with their dads <laughs> or at least i wasn't from my experience some are and it's lovely to see but it is a it, yeah macho tough Welshman says Caroline yeah well my old man was a Scot um, and it was all, you know he's like you know proper like big like he was just massive the guy was just like a you know a machine um, proper big man's man um, so we just didn't express our feelings I mean particularly well at all um, I remember thinking that when he died I was like shit like I think even the last time I ever saw him. And he'd, he'd had a heart attack and he was in, I took my mum to see him and the, the nurse didn't even know I had any other next of kin. He had any, any other next of kin. She just thought it was me. And then when she found out my mum was still around. She was like, oh, you need to go and get your mum now. And that was when I realised it was really serious. And I took my mum in. He was kind of sat in the bed and he, he wasn't great or anything like that. But even like the very last thing, um, I still didn't say it then. I just, I kind of tapped him on a like, very blokey thing. I just kind of tapped him on. I went, look after yourself, big man. I mean, thoroughly expecting to see him at six o'clock that night when we were going to go back to visit, not knowing that would be the last time I ever saw him alive. Um, maybe it would have been different had I known. I'm very glad I didn't know what was coming, obviously. Um, but even that, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I do I, I do acknowledge in my own life there are definitely areas where I could be so much more expressive in my feelings. And I'm really expressive to people these days of gratitude. I'm so good at that and appreciate appreciation of people. Um, but there's still definitely other areas of my life that I'm like, not as open as I, as, as I probably should be, and I think we all probably are if we're if we're honest with ourselves. Um, but it's uh, can you do the Scottish accent then, Ross? Yeah, I can. I, I, my, my, dad, my dad used to teach me. He'd be like, you have to, "There's a rhyme you can say. You can say, I put my foot in a bucket, and I foot the bucket a boot, and the mother foot the bucket, and the mother bucket a newt. It's like that, pal. Um, but yeah, he used to like teach me things on the football pitch. You go, if anyone fouls you, just say this. I'd be like, what? And he's like, can you stitch, pal? It's like stitch what? Stitch this. I said bottom. I never did that. Obviously, it was very violent. Um, but yeah, um, none of my mates could barely understand me, Dad. Half the time, it was quite funny. I used to have to translate for them. Like, what did your dad just say? <laughs> oh, no idea. <laughs> Something about iron brew. I don't know. <laughs> Only joking. We used to give him quite a bit of stick for that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it, I just think ultimately the moral of this story is just to be more open with you know with people i'm going to throw out some slides guys because i forgot i even had these slides I, I make these slides every week and i completely forgot to even use them tonight so this was the title of the book club have you ever played a scott i haven't caroline i haven't um no i've done i've done quite a lot i've done like america oh no i did play a scottish dragon in a cartoon once um a dra i think all dragons in cartoons are better when they're scottish just great isn't it? and he had a little scottish hat on so obviously he was scottish um so this was it this is what we looked at tonight guys i wish i had had the courage to express my feelings and it is all about courage and um, this is Bronnie, and there's a little uh quote from Bronnie. i think she's she's very wise in that quote it says success is never about what other people think of you but of what you think of yourself it's about having the freedom to live how you wish in a way that feels peaceful to your own heart. And there's the cover of the book if you want to get it. You can get it on Amazon. If you're watching this on the replay on atsonthis.tv, um, then the link to Amazon to get the book will just be below. Click on that. If you're on the audio experience, um, it won't be. Get yourself over to atsonthis.tv or just search for Top 5 Regrets of the Dying on Amazon. It's quite a cheap book. It's about six quid, I think. Um, so there, the, the question is just to, to end on, guys. Like, you know, Are you expressing your feelings to the people who matter to you most? That's one area of this. Like I said, family, definitely. I know I could be better at it. Equally, though, are you being honest about your feelings in your life and career? So how your career relates to all that sort of stuff, you know, because some people are like, oh, you know, I'm doing this job and I'm not really being true to my feelings because my feelings are telling me that this isn't what I should be doing. I should be doing something else, but limiting beliefs are stopping me from doing that thing. And sometimes if you're feeling pulled for long enough then like you know you're not 
in the right you're not doing the right thing with your life right now if you're constantly feeling pulled feeling pulled to something else but you're almost not expressing that feeling of wanting to do something else for whatever reason for fear of ridicule for fear of i don't know you know just well it's ultimately it's what they said in the book is is for fear of getting hurt for fear of experiencing pain um so you must be it's just literally just this is it guys it's one life you've got to be honest with your feelings and then are you holding back i've put there for some reason and if you are why try and figure it out um can I just make a book suggestion? Says Brian, stop acting and start living. I'll check it out, Brian. You can, everyone can always make book suggestions, by the way. Just tweet me at Acts on This TV. If you found a good book, I love, you know, discovering new books. So, yeah, that would really be helpful. Uh, so, yeah, are you expressing your feelings to the people who matter most? Are you being honest about your feelings in your life and career? Are you holding back for some reason why? Do you need to send a text right now to somebody who you're like, actually, you know what? I just want to tell you something. Just want to say I appreciate you. This is what I, I, I might start doing. I read about this a couple of days ago, guys. I think this is nice. Every morning, I read about this guy who texts somebody randomly, chooses them at random out of his phone book, and just texts them a lovely message every morning to say how he appreciates them or what you know for what role they play in his life. Sometimes it might be randomly like his dentist. <laughs> Other times it could be family, friends. You know, people he's not seen in months. But I thought that's a really nice thing to do in it, to go like, ta-da, surprise, today you've won the text of the day. Um, you know, and just say, look, I just want to, you know, express some some feeling here, you know, whatever that may be, that, you know, I appreciate you and thanks for everything that you, you know, you do for me, you bring to my life. I might start doing that. I think it's a really nice thing to do and it'll really impact other people's life positively. Um, and then we've got a quote to end on, guys. This is Helen Keller. It says, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? The fe your feelings always come from the heart, and you've just got to be truthful. George Bakari said in the interview I did on this TV with him the other day, he said, you've got to live with a full heart. Um, and your heart always knows the truth. Helen Keller is freaking awesome, says Fanny. Um, I always try and compliment people, says Car uh, Caroline, that's good. It takes so little effort to send a text and it can make a massive difference to someone. So Sam, definitely can. Also, guys, as well, what I want people to, to realise, I'm going to come back on camera as well, because I have a bit of beef with this, this whole text thing. People are like, not, people somehow value texts less than writing a letter and putting a stamp on it and posting it, right? And I, I don't. I think, you know what, I don't care how long it's taken you, whether you've handwritten something or you've sent it digitally. Ultimately, times have just changed. Previously, we had to write letters. It was the only way to communicate. And nobody, you know, I bet at the time no one was slagging letters off going, oh, you're writing a letter on paper. You should be running round to that person's I don't know, that person's place and writing this on their cave wall. You know, they're probably like, oh, letters are a terrible invention. Bullshit. It's just one way of communicating with someone. And today we have so many better ways, more convenient ways. If I, if I feel somebody's down right now, I feel someone's like, you know, I'm like, you know what, my, pain, my, my friend is in pain right now. So I've got two options. I can send them a letter that will get there in three days or I can send them a text right now, reach out and make a difference this minute that could stop them doing something stupid. That, for me, is so much more powerful than a letter. So I want people to start appreciating, actually, that, that, that text, email, letters, however, there is no hierarchy. If you are communicating authentically and with passion and honesty and truth and integrity, it doesn't matter what the medium is. You could send smoke signals wouldn't it be just as valuable, you know, whatever it is. Um, but people are like, oh, you have to put so much effort into a letter. Well, you do, but what if what if the message you need to get to someone is critical now because someone's in such a bad place that they need your help right now? A letter's not going to cut it. Um, so let's start appreciating the message, not the medium, um, because otherwise we're missing the point. We're just missing the point. Um, I think a letter is nice, if you've got the time, but I don't value it. If someone sent me a letter, I wouldn't value it more than a text or an email. I just wouldn't. I'd go, yes, okay. Is the message genuine? Has the person written this with a full heart? And if they have, then I'm going to take that and I'm going to thank you very much for it. Just my opinion. Something that I have 
quite strong opinions on because I just think that, yeah, the message is the message is the message. It doesn't matter whether you're sending me in blood or, you know, digitally. I'll thank you for it. Um, so that's it for the book club tonight, guys. But, yeah, I think just expressing our feelings more, telling people more about how we feel is great. My pen pal doesn't like him if I Facebook him. He gets funny, says, put it in the letter. Well, it depends what, you know, if you've got a a setup that's like this is actually an activity that we do and we communicate through letters, then I guess like, you know, do it through letters. I get, you know, that's that's quite cool. But to actually then, you know, it's just to appreciate what's said in the message, not the way that you receive it. Someone could shout to me from the my garden and, and it'd mean just as much as if they wrote it and put it through the door. Be like, the message is just the same. Um, I think I think what's nice about a letter is the fact that you can keep it. It's physical, but you could just print off a text if you wanted. You could take a screenshot of it and print it off. Um, what's nice now, what's really cool, is people start sending these. These are really lovely. So there's a company called Touchnote. Has anyone ever used Touchnote before? A little promo for Touchnote here. They can give me some commission for this. Um, it allows you to send a message and a postcard um, to somebody from your phone and you take a picture on your phone and then you can just choose a picture from your phone, write a text and then it, and then choose somebody's address and it will send that as a postcard with the, the picture and the text on it written. Obviously it's printed, it's not handwritten, but I think that's quite nice to receive um, and that's halfway house, isn't it, between writing and digital um, so te- check out Touchnote. I think you can buy credits and I think they work out like a pound or something like that, it's, you know, to send one. Um, you can send anywhere in the world as well. So it is, uh, it's pretty cool. It was nice when I, when I got that one through. It's uh, a lovely message on it. Um, so that's cool. Um, so that's it for the book club, guys. Um, we've got one more week on the book club. And with, there's only, I think there's a couple of chapters left we can choose from. We're only going to do one more week on this because then we will have done four weeks. I know March is a long month, but we're going to start a different book. We're only going to ever do four sessions on a book um but so it means we're going to end up starting april's book a little bit earlier um but we've got a couple of chapters to choose from we can have uh we've done that one so we can have i wish i hadn't worked so hard it's an interesting one because i'm all about the work man i'm all about the hard work but i love what i do so it doesn't feel like work um and then we've got i oh that you know what this resonates with me because this was something remember i said i struggled with this last year and it was actually to do with the fact that all i did was work um i wish i had stayed in touch with my friends who had friends growing up and you were inseparable and now as adults you're like i've not spoke to you in 10 years i wonder what you're doing i've got friends like that um I think that'd be quite cool, wouldn't it? I think sometimes it's lovely to reach out to people you haven't seen. And that's one thing digital lets you do. A letter doesn't let you do that because you wouldn't know someone's address. Facebook lets you do that. Text lets you do that. That's one up on letters there. Yeah, do that one, says Sam. Caroline says friends as well. Yeah, I like that one. So next week we're going to read, yeah, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. <sighs> Maybe that's going to be a bit, a bit of an emotional one, isn't it, for this book? Someone's obviously going to die having not stayed in touch with their friends. Well, we're going to find out what, what that person is next week. Um, then we're going to look at a different book. So, yes, yeah, send me your suggestions at Ats on this TV on Twitter. Make sure you're following me on Instagram. Um, I'm loving it. Fanny said she's getting addicted to it. It's a, it's, a, it's a new platform to get used to if you've never used it before. It's, you know, it's got a bit of a learning curve. But Instagram stories, guys, I swear is where the attention is going to. It's easier than any platform to garner attention for your life and your career I've never experienced anything quite like it in terms of documentation. Like I said the other day as well, as actors, we can complain and get bitchy about reality TV and all this kind of stuff and go, oh, reality TV, oh, that's, you know, stealing our jobs, blah, 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 blah. And we get all bitter about it, yeah, that's one option. The other option is to go, well, you know what? The market is the market is the market. The market right now is lapping up reality TV. Might do for another decade. We're actors, so we want to act. However... If we want to raise our profiles in general, you know, maybe we can mix the two genres. We can still act, but then also we can document the fact that we're doing that and turn it into reality where people can follow our careers so we get the best of both. Instagram stories is like Towie in your pocket, right? But it's your own version of it, whatever you want to make it. Far classier, I hope. Um, So let's give the market what it wants, which ultimately is voyeurism, 
following people's lives, seeing behind the closed door, closed curtains. Um, I was Kaggy Dunlop. Someone just said, "Isn't she in uh, uh, Chelsea? Made in Chelsea, Kaggy Dunlop." You can be your own version of Kaggy Dunlop. Um, but yeah, you know, you can you can effectively have your own reality show in your pocket, which is you and your life, and hopefully an authentic version of you. This is the key. It's easy to see through the bullshit. We know when people are... Well, I do. I can see when people are bullshitting me and they're showing the parts of their life they just wish they, you know, either wish they were and they're not. They're just kind of like, you know, I don't know, fronting. Um, or they're only showing the best bits. Um, it's nice to show the real, just the reality of it. It doesn't mean showing your bad bits, showing your good bits. It just means showing your bits, not your actual bits. Just your life or right? unless <laughs> maybe that maybe people do do that on instagram stories they probably got a lot of followers um but yeah it's not you know trying to be something um i love just seeing people and their everyday kind of stuff and to you that might not be interesting but it's interesting for me and everybody else because we aren't living your life of course it's not interesting for you because it's your life you know well hopefully it's a bit interesting for you should be living an interesting life but um you know, it's just nice to see into what people are doing and how they are choosing to live. That's that's what I find interesting. I'm like, what are you choosing to do? And some people, I watch their stories and I'm like, you're not making very good choices here, in my opinion. Other um, ones, I'm like, wow, great choice. You're making really good choices with your life. Brian says, how's the gym? And my, my mate Bert, yeah, so my mate Bert in the gym, sometimes I Instagram him on my story. He's 84 He's been married for 50 odd years to the love of his life, a woman called Norma. He calls her Normie. Um, he says it exactly like it is. He calls a spade a spade. Um, and he's got a lot of wisdom to give out. I love old people because, they're, like I say, this is why this book's so good because we can live not making their mistakes. Or if they have made mistakes, hopefully they can pass that knowledge and wisdom onto us and we don't have to make those mistakes. That's what's so beautiful about like youth. And one day we're going to be Bert's age, I hope, if we all get there. I want to get to 100 years old. And I don't want to make the same mistakes that he's made, hopefully. Um, I will have made different ones, and I can pass them on to people who are younger than me. But I can see it in their eyes. I can see almost a little bit of envy in like, oh, you little bastard, God, what, what, I wish I was 34 again. The same kind of envy that I see when it, well, I feel in myself when I see somebody who's 19 with all this opportunity in front of them. And I'm like, if I could go back to 19, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't go back otherwise. It's what we always say. But I'm like, oh God, the opportunity these people have, and I don't know if they appreciate it yet. Youth's wasted on the young, isn't it? Ultimately, and I'm still classing myself well as pretty young, but I still think youth is wasted um, on the young. Um, but Bert's great. We can learn. I think everybody it should be mandatory for everybody to go and volunteer one day of their life at an old person's home. I just do. And you will find people there who are happy and fulfilled. And equally, I'm sure you will see the look of regret in people's faces. Um, get Bert in for an interview. Everyone wants Bert. I'll get Bert on for something. I'll interview him on, on my iPhone for you all. Um, but yeah, I think if we, if we went and volunteered in a nursing home for a day, um, I think you come out with a very different perspective on life. Um, I, I have a very different perspective every time I read a bit of that book. It just reminds me again, because this is all stuff that we know as well, guys. We know we should be living in the present. We know we should be grateful. We know should, we should be focusing on everything we have, not what we don't have. We need constant reminders of it all the time. And there's nothing more of a potent reminder than seeing the regret in someone else's eyes and going, phew, I don't live with that burden yet. If I'm not careful, I might end up doing so. I need to be very conscious and make sure that I'm not going to end up like that. Um, but it's powerful. Um, but yeah, go and volunteer at an old people's home. I think it'll be good for everybody. I'd put it into the school curriculum if I was in charge. Go, right, you must go and do it. Because the kids, you're like, old people? <laughs> don't want to know about them. They know nothing. Not realising they were once your age as well. Uh, they've got so much, so much to give. I've got friends from 17 to 75. Oh, well, Bert's 84. But people I hang out with regular, um, 75. Um, some of my best mates are in their 60s. Um, I've got mates in their foot. I've got mate, like such a whole wide variety of age groups of people that I actively hang out with and will spend quality time with. And I learn so much. I think I become a much more rounded person because of that. Um, so I would recommend that. Don't, have, don't just have friends that are your age. 
Um, it's all good. Right, well, it's um, it's gone 10 o'clock, hasn't it? It's just gone 10 o'clock. Wow. Okay, so that's it. We've been on for an hour, guys. I'm going to let you go. You hang out with 75-year-olds, Ross? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, so one of my mates, Eric, is 65. My mate, John Dutton, big shout out to him, 71, I think now. Um, his wife makes an incredible tea loaf. Um, she's awesome. Uh, Mrs. D. Um, but yeah, no, I love it. I love having an eclectic mix of friends. And then equally, I'll mentor people much younger than me. So I'll go for coffees. My mate James wants to set up a social media agency. He's like 21. Um, and I love it because I learn from these people up here who are older than me. I absorb all that. I utilize it, put it into my own life, see what works. And I can pass that on to the younger people. And it's like that whole cycle of you know life, effectively. It's, it's, so, it's so nice. Our, one of our main human needs when we have our four main human needs fulfilled, which are certainty, variety, significance, and love and connection. When we have those fulfilled, we can then move on to growth, which is where we feel we're growing spiritually or emotionally. And then above that, we have contribution. Um, which is where you feel most fulfilled, which is why people get so much fulfillment out of kids because they can teach their kids and they can, you know, and they're like, wow, look, he's learned to sit up today. They feel that they've done that. They pass that kind of knowledge on and that's contribution. You get that equally when you contribute to anybody's life. It's why I do these periscopes for free twice a week, give you hours of my life. Um, because I love it. Because I'm like, I'm contributing, I'm giving back. This is, this is bigger than me. It's bigger than myself. And it's always, it's quite a selfish thing because, you know, I do, I don't get paid for this, obviously, but I get a damn sight of satisfaction back from it. Um, you should definitely have people of all ages around you, um, says Caroline, I think. Yeah, no, you definitely, uh, you definitely should. I just think it, it just, you've just got so much to learn from people. Don't write young people off as knowing nothing. They can teach you things. Don't write old people off as being past it. They can teach you things. It's very, very important. Right, so I'm going to go, guys. I hope you've enjoyed that. I'm going to be putting um, a podcast out on Friday called um, the five to thrive podcast over on itunes um, on the act on this audio experience uh, for those who are listening and they've been on this long massively appreciate you whether you're walking the dog on the way to the gym going to an audition whatever you're doing you're listening just to the audio on itunes huge shout out um, if you want to um subscribe to that guys get it for free delivered to your iphone or your android or whatever if you've got an iphone go to itunes and just search for act on this tv and you'll find it if you've got an android go to stitcher.com search for acts on this tv and you'll find it on there as well completely free once you subscribe you'll get a new episode every time it goes out so the audio from these periscopes goes out as well as the five to thrive podcast as well as random phone calls i make to industry people um, and just little rants i might have a section guys called grants rants what do you reckon <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool i think brian wanted to see the company rules company rules brian see if we can move this around um yeah decide take responsibility be humble never give up show initiative laugh don't complain find a solution keep on learning take pride in your work open your mind embrace change big one that collaborate listen um improve daily and lead not follow and leaders, for me, create leaders, not followers. So if you're looking to create a social media following, it's bullshit. You should be looking to inspire people to become leaders themselves um, and, you know, and collaborate ultimately. That's what I, I aim to do, not, not have followers. I don't want to have followers because I, I want you guys to be action takers um, and, you know, and create your own stuff. It's, it, you know, almost for me, it's like, if I get no engagement sometimes on social media, it's like, well, that's fine because hopefully these people are out doing stuff with their lives. And that's a win for me because that's what I try and encourage people to do, not sit at home and just reply to me on social media. So it's nice sometimes where I'm like, okay, I put that out there. Nobody's bloody replied, but hopefully it means they've taken action on what I told them to do last night and that's why they're busy. Um, so that's cool. Right, so I'm going to go. Appreciate you. But yeah, like I say, iTunes and Stitcher, Get on that. If you're watching this on the replay and you're not part of the Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash acts on this TV. Caroline's registered for Deepak Chopra's med uh, meditation course. Awesome. Deepak's legend. Um, that's it. She said it's free. Great. Enjoy that. Uh, sounds right. Or Fanny Street, that I reckon. Um, definitely. But what the key to a lot of this is, guys, right? It's very, it's very tempting to collect stuff, collect courses, collect classes, collect shiny objects, effectively. Um, there's a point where you've got to stop collecting these courses and you've got to start acting on the one you've just done that you've learned about. A lot of people will go, right, I'm going to do this personal development course. Right, I'm going to do this marketing course. I'm going to do this product creation course. 
And then they just go from course to course to course, never acting on what they've just learned. There comes a point where you've got to go stop. I've done this before sometimes when I've been listening to podcasts from a lot of people and I've been subscribed to six, seven people's podcasts. And I'm like, try to listen to them. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm spending too much of my time listening and not enough time creating myself. And I've had to call a few of them and go, no, I'm just going to choose two. And that means that, you know, I don't take up as much of my time. And I'll come back to those other ones because they're always going to be there. Sometimes you've got to do that as well. So definitely, you know, whatever you learn on Deepak's course, um, before you go and do another one, utilize it, embrace it, employ it into your life. Um, otherwise, you will go through your life feeling busy, but you'll never actually be productive. Um, it's, uh, it's important. I've caught myself in that trap over the years. And then I never execute. So you've got to execute. Um, I'm going to leave people now with um, that clip of George's interview again. Who's watched George Bakari's interview? I think it's one of the most inspiring ones I've done. Great guy. I've had fantastic feedback on it. Um, I had a lot of tweets today about it. Um, it's really good. Um, Fanny says, yeah, yes, yeah, she has. Um, no, it's great. Honestly, it's, it's a really good interview. It's about an hour and five minutes long, the full version of it. You need a premium membership to watch the full version of it. It's only 10 quid a month, though. Or seven pound fifty a month if you pay for a year, and the money goes to um, a lot of that revenue goes to charities that I support. Um, the more people join premium, the more revenue I raise, the more higher profile guests I can entice on with bigger charity donations. Um, so I massively appreciate everyone who's supporting me by being a premium member of Ads on This. If that's not financially viable for you right now, and you're like, I can't do the ten quid a month. It's cool. Just appreciate you being here. Hopefully at some point it will be uh, it will be viable. Um, but here is a clip of George's interview. Just one minute, three little bits of it um, that I think was valuable. Little piece he said, hopefully it'll give you a little bit of a kick. And um, remember guys, get out there, be more open and honest with your feelings. I will see you soon. We'll be back on Monday for Motivation and Mind Hacks. Until then, bye for now. And then when I went into the room, I sat there and then Mackenzie Crooks sat opposite me and Michelle Keegan's there and Jason Manford's there and Sally Lindsay's there and Joe Joyner's there and I thought wow okay I'm really really out of my depth here how am I going to handle this when you walk away and you think you've absolutely nailed that audition you know and you think to yourself oh god that, that was the best audition I've ever done in my life and I've had some of those moments I've where, had that exactly that and exact then the phone will ring and you think god, what did I do wrong do you know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing's possible, but you spend so much time doubting yourself. You can't doubt yourself. You you have to do it because you live once, and that's it. You know, and you should do things with a full heart, and you should just push, 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 push. You get knocked back, push again. Mm -hmm.